Good morning, everybody. Uh, OK, um, after great confusion on our part, uh, Mike has agreed to download the figures uh, for the course reader for, uh, to, e to B space. So um, we are ending up doing that, even though I thought we wouldn't do it, but so be it. Um, office hours again today, what, 9 to 10, and on Thursday, 9 to 10, and there were tons of people who came on Monday, and um, I don't know where we're going to fit you all, but we, we will try. A couple of points I want to make concerning Monday's lecture. Uh, one is um, I was talking about the structure of proteins, and I said that um, proteins that are soluble in solution uh, form what we call globs, globular proteins. And then I was going to explain to you the basis of that folding, and I never did. So I want to just make this point. You know, based on the side chains of amino acids, the polarity or the nonpolarity, that some side chains are going to interact with water and some are not. And this is basically what drives the globular structure of proteins. On the surface of these proteins, you will find charged or polar amino acid side chains. You will find very few nonpolar side chains. The nonpolar side chains are inside the molecule, away from water, and this results in the protein folding in this sort of amorphous globular uh, shape. And then at the uh, office hours, there were lots of questions about the phospholipid molecule, so I thought I would just briefly go over that again. I've drawn a phospholipid on the, on the board. A phospholipid, and, and the reason this is important is we will talk about phospholipids again when we talk about membrane structure, so they, they are important. Uh, on the board, you have um, a glycerol molecule, which is a sterified to two fatty acids, R1 and R2. The third carbon in glycerol is a sterified to a phosphoric acid. So that's the phospho in the phospholipid. The phosphoric acid can esterify to an additional compound, and that is an organic alcohol. So the phosphate group in a phospholipid is involved in what we call phosphodiester bonds because it is formed two esters. One is to glycerol, and one is to some low molecular weight organic alcohol molecule. And I gave you some examples. There's not only one compound that functions as R3. There are many, many different compounds, and most membranes have a mixture of, for example, phosphatidylcholine, which is the, the, the phospholipid shown in one of the figures in the handout. But there are other compounds that can fill this space, such as serine, which is an amino acid, inositol, which is a sugar, glycerol, which is an alcohol, Etc. So there's a large variety of compounds that can can uh, bind to become components of phospholipids. I guess I want to say. Uh, I hope that's clear. Um, you're going to hear more about phosphodiesters today, and you're going to hear more about um, some other kinds of phosphate groups later um, in a week or two. Okay. So I want to finish up talking about um, molecules biological molecules, macromolecules. And the next group of macromolecules are, are what we call the, the uh, carbohydrates uh, and or sugars, as we affectionately know them in everyday life. And carbohydrates, whereas lipids are highly uh, insoluble in water, carbohydrates are generally very, very soluble in water. They have a general formula of CH2O, and they are filled with hydroxide groups. So this is glucose, the sort of benchmark carbohydrate. Its formula is C6H12O6, and you can see that this compound is, is uh, very, would be expected to be very hydrophilic, very soluble in water. The trademark of sugars are the OH groups that are attached to carbons multiple OH groups. And in addition to that, carbohydrates will contain either an aldehyde group or a ketone group. This sugar 
looks very much like this one, but it has a ketone instead of an aldehyde. This sugar is fructose, same structure as glucose. This sugar is glucose. This is considered to be an aldose sugar. This is a keto sugar. Uh, if you look at figure 25, you can see that the sugars come in a large number of arrays. There are three carbon sugars, which are trioses. There are four carbon sugars. There are five carbon sugars, which are pentoses. And there are six carbon sugars, which are hexoses. We will talk primarily later on about the three and five carbon sugars, we will, uh, six carbon sugars. We'll talk about pentoses today when we talk about the structure of nucleic acid. Um, in solution, I think since you all have had some organic chemistry, you know that these compounds in solution don't exist as a linear chain. They form a ring. And the ring structure is shown in figure 26. So you've got glucose there where it forms a ring. And when it forms a ring, one of the carbon atoms can have a hydroxide either above the ring or below the ring. So on the left, the, ox on the, left, uh, the hydroxide on group is oriented above the ring. That is beta D glucose. On the right, the hydroxide ring group is pointed below the ring, and that is alpha glucose. Okay? Um, both of those forms of glucose will be found in polysaccharides. One of the uh, interesting features of, of the carbohydrates is there are isomers, lots and lots of different isomers. All I've got to do is move this OH to the other side of the carbon. And basically, I get a new molecule. Um, one compound would be glucose. The other compound would be galactose. Now, this seems like a very small, minor change. But when one starts to deal with enzymes, which are involved in metabolizing these compounds, this uh, slight change in structure can produce an enormous change. This is the structure of this molecule can produce an enormous change in the specificity of a protein for that particular molecule. Let's see if there's anything else. No, I don't want to say anything more. OK, glucose, what is glucose? What kind of molecule is it? What's its function in the cell? Basically, glucose is a major energy compound. We metabolize glucose during cellular respiration. We'll talk about that in, in much more detail. So we haven't talked about um, you know, the function of these compounds in terms of producing energy for the cell. But the main function of all the carbohydrates is to be degraded and to form um, and to release energy that the cell can use. Okay? And these compounds can be interchanged. And you'll see when we talk about respiration that we start off with a glucose molecule, but then it's converted into a fructose molecule, and then it undergoes subsequent reactions. Uh, figure 28 shows the formation of some disaccharides. Again, these are not structures you should memorize. Don't memorize them. And I've given you uh, really three examples. The most common disaccharide that you're familiar with is obviously sucrose which is at the top of figure 28. Sucrose is a disaccharide that contains a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule. Very relatively straightforward. Um, uh, lactose is sort of milk sugar. Lactose contains two glucose molecules. Okay? And then maltose contains two glucose molecules, but in a different uh, bonding than lactose. Maltose is a compound that you're going to have some experience with when? Next week, Mike? When you do your enzymes lab. Two weeks, OK. You do an enzyme lab where you uh, use an enzyme amylase, and you break down starch, which is a polysaccharide found in um, plants. And the product of that reaction is maltose. So you're going to learn more about maltose in a week or so, week or two. Um, the other thing that happens to these glucose units, which is the, the unit of 
that becomes the high molecular weight polymer is that they form high molecular weight polymers. And there are uh, one, two, three, four polymers that I want to talk about. This basically summarizes the properties of the four polysaccharides that are relevant to our discussion. As you can see in figure 29, um, the top figure, the top structure in that figure is glycogen. Glycogen is a is a energy storage polymer in animals. So I've written here glycogen A is for animals. It's formed from alpha D glucose units. So I've put here alpha glucose. It is it is a branched polymer. And if you look at the structure of glycogen, you find as you go around the, the ring, each carbon has a number, one, two, three, four, five, six, that um, these, these polymers, such as glycogen, has a one, four bond. That's the linear portion of it, a linkage. And then the branches are one, six bonded, OK? Glycogen is called a highly branched polymer because it's more branched than the next polymer that we'll talk about. Uh, what we do in our cells is during the day or whenever we're, we're taking in food, we store carbohydrates in, in the form of glycogen in our liver. And then subsequently, we break down that glycogen and to glucose units and obtain energy from that. Uh, plants do something similar. They obviously don't have a liver. But they produce, during the daylight, starch. Starch is composed of two polymers, amylose and amylopectin. These are shown at the bottom of figure 29. They're both glucose polymers. Uh, one is branched and one is non-branched. That's really the only difference between amylose and amylopectin. The branching, again, is 1,4 in amylose, 1,4 and 1,6 in amylopectin. Now, what plants do is during the day, they make starch. And uh, sometimes when you're doing the photosynthesis experiment and you isolate chloroplasts, you can actually see the starch pellet. It depends on what time of day the spinach is picked. Because uh, if it's the end of the day, the starch is starting to be broken down. But during a day, uh, plants will synthesize starch, store it in the chloroplast, and then at the night, when there's no sunlight, there's no photosynthesis, the starch is broken down to glucose units, and actually plants carry out respiration at night. There's one other um, carbohydrate polymer that needs to be mentioned, and that is turns out to be the most predominant biological molecule in our world, believe it or not. It's a plant carbohydrate, polysaccharide, and it's cellulose, because cellulose is a component of plant cell walls. So every time you see a tree out there, think cellulose. Cellulose uh, is unusual in that it does not use alpha glucose. It uses this form of glucose that I just mentioned, beta glucose, where the OH is in a different orientation than in alpha glucose. It is a 1,4 non-branched polymer. Now, that may not seem like such a, an important thing, but you can see that in figure 30, the starch molecules, which have 1,4 um, bonding with alpha glucose and the ones, the cellulose, where you have the beta glucose units, they, the, the, the final product looks different. And it's very difficult to digest starch. Enzymes that break down, I'm sorry, it's very difficult to break down cellulose. Enzymes that will break down starch, such as amylase, this enzyme you're going to work with, will not break down cellulose because the bonding in cellulose involves beta glucose, not alpha glucose. Um, OK, that, that's, that's really all I'm going to say about carbohydrates. I, I'd say you know the, the most important bit of thing that you should take home from this is this table that shows you the different polymers and what they're composed of and something about the branching. All right? OK, we're going to move on quickly to the final group of molecules. And again, this is something I don't spend much time on because it's not 
something that is germane to anything that comes later. Bob Fisher will go into the structure of nucleic acids in much more detail. But at this point, I only want to give you the sort of big picture so that we can have our table of you know, macromolecules and what they are and what their structure is and what kind of bonding is found. The basic unit of uh, a nucleic acid is something which is called a nucleotide. And if you look at figure 31, the bottom of that um, figure shows you a nucleotide. A nucleotide has three components. It has an organic base, and the bases are shown above the structure of the, um, of the nucleotide. And those can be rather complicated bases or somewhat simpler bases. They are either purines or pyrimidines. There are, oh, let's see. The next component in a nucleotide is a five carbon sugar, a pentose sugar. That's shown in the figure at the bottom of the page. That five carbon sugar can be one of two things. It can be ribose or it can be deoxyribose. And if you have it in, if you have deoxyribose, you have DNA. If you have ribose, you have RNA. And the difference between um, deoxyribose and ribose is the C2 carbon, there's an OH in uh, ribose, and there's only a hydrogen in deoxyribose. And then the third thing you have in a nucleotide is a phosphate group. There is a phosphate group esterified to one of the carbons on the pentose ring, the five carbon. Okay. It's esterified through a phosphoester bond. So what you do is you take nucleotides and you start to put them together. Um, the nomenclature that's used is shown in figure 31A. The five nucleotides that are found in the nucleic acids are adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and thymine, abbreviated AGCUT. That's helpful. And um, figure 31B is an important figure because it shows you how you make a polymer. You take two nucleotides and you stick them together with a phosphodiester bond. A phosphodiester bond, look at the bottom of figure 31B between the five prime carbon and the three prime carbon. So you start off with two nucleotides, so you've got two phosphate groups. One of them leaves, and the phosphate group on the other group, nucleotide reacts with an OH on a carbon in the other sugar ring. And you build up your chain by continually doing this, 3, 5, 3, 5, 3, 5. That's the basis of the nucleic acid, and in many ways, the reason I of course, I, I always erase the wrong thing. <laughs> the, um, I, I mentioned the phosphodiester bond in phospholipids is you are forming five phosphodiester bonds in nucleic acids. Figure 31C, table 31C is about as much as I want you to know about these nucleic acids at this stage of the game. What's the difference between DNA and RNA? Well, I've told you one difference. The sugar is different. The second different is the bases are different. Both of them have adenine. Both of them have cytosine. Both of them have guanine. But DNA has the base thymine, and RNA has the base uracil. To sort of complete the story, we have to talk about the structure, and uh, we have to identify a few important characters. Obviously, everybody here knows Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick, in 1954, published a very short paper, uh, literally one page, I believe. I have a copy of it somewhere, in Nature, describing the structure of DNA. And the structure, as most people should be aware of, is a double helix, two strands of nucleic, nucleic acid 
twisted around each other, and hydrogen bonds between the bases are stabilizing that structure. There's Watson and Crick in figure 33, and there's their structure of DNA, uh, also shown. But more importantly, um, at the top of that figure, figure 32A shows how uh, data was obtained to, uh, to get that re resulted in the structure. And th that data was obtained through X-ray crystallography by uh, scientist Rosalind Franklin. Has anybody heard about Rosalind Franklin? Most of you have. Rosalind Franklin had the data. And I think it's now documented that James Watson stole the data from her and put forward this model with Crick for the structure of DNA. Of course, Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize for this work uh, and became, you know, probably two of the most famous scientists of the 20th century. This is really the start of modern molecular biology when the structure was determined. And um, Rosalind Franklin was pretty much overlooked. And now I think people realize her contribution to this work. And um, she is uh, recognized for these contributions. Unfortunately, I think she died in her 30s from cancer and didn't have much opportunity to bask in the glory. It's not a very nice story about science, <laughs> but it does happen. OK, so what we have in the nucleic acid is we have a nucleotide unit, which is being polymerized through phosphodiester bonds. And we end up with these complicated molecules, which are alpha helices, chains running around each other. There's a lot of important features of how uh, this molecule is formed and how it is duplicated. And uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. So that's all I want to say about molecules. Um, there's one additional thing that's not directly related to molecules. If you look at figure 35, there are compounds which are sort of nucleotides or related to nucleotides, which have other functions. And we're going to be talking about many of these later on. Um, in figure 35, the first compound, see, I don't call ATP a nucleotide is the compound ATP, which we'll talk about extensively. Because if I define a nucleotide as a phosphate, sugar, and a base, well, ATP has three phosphate groups. But ATP is related to nucleotides. The second compound, which is coenzyme A, is a more complicated molecule. It has parts of it that look like ATP, like a nucleotide, but parts that don't. We will talk about coenzyme A extensively during respiration. Um, and then there's a compound that John Forte will talk about in his portion, which is a signaling molecule where you have an AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate, one phosphate, whereas where the phosphate group is not simply sitting out there, but it cycles. It's a cyclic molecule, cyclic AMP, and this is a molecule involved in, in transmitting signals throughout the cell. So those uh, are compounds you're going to hear about again in, in some detail. OK, if you go to page 17 now, we have finished structure and function of biological molecules. There's a number of questions there that are, um, I think they're pretty easy. Uh, people always say, well, are, are you going to give us the answers? No, I'm not going to give you the answers. They're so easy, you don't have to get the answers to them. Really, they're very easy. These are not profound questions, but they review the subjects that I've covered in these couple of lectures. Any questions? Any comments? Any unhappiness? OK. OK, I'm going to turn now to moving from molecules to cells. We, we know that the, mo the molecules that I've talked about don't exist you know, just in an ether or don't exist in solution. There is an organization to biological material. And the basic unit of biology is the cell. And um, we, can dis we can identify two major features of all cells. These are rather big cells, little cells, complicated cells, simple cells. All cells contain a membrane. 
and this is why membranes are important. The membrane separates inside from outside. So the easiest way to think of this is here's a cell, and that's a membrane. So there's an inside space where biology occurs, and there's an outside space, which is sort of the aqueous environment that this cell may find itself in. Um, this is a barrier, but as you'll see when we talk about membrane structure, it is not a barrier that doesn't allow things in and out because there has to be communication between the inside and the outside. The second thing that all cells have is they contain a genetic material. And we'll talk a bit about this, but not as much, not in as much detail as Bob Fisher will. And the genetic material directs the cell's activities and allows cells to reproduce. And for all intents and purposes, we're talking about DNA here, okay? I am, at least. Um, the organization of these materials allows us to separate cells into two types. Oh, I don't want to erase that. Don't erase that. There are cells in which, and, and the organization of the genetic material is what dictates how we characterize cells. We have cells which are known as uh, prokaryotes, prokaryotic cells. Pro. prokaryotes, in which the DNA is in the form of a circular molecule and is located in the cell associated with some protein, not a lot of protein. The contrast with this, so there's single DNA molecule. And of course, people always raise the question, is this a chromosome or not, then I, I guess it would be called a one chromosome. But it's a single DNA molecule, circular. But this DNA is not localized in any specific region. Prokaryote means non-nuclear. So what I'm going to say now is no nucleus. The second type of cell, eukaryote, the DNA is not a single circular molecule. It is linear, linear pieces of DNA. So as where a prokaryote has one chromosome, a eukaryote has many chromosomes. And also, and, and this DNA is associated with proteins which are known as histones. I won't talk about histones at all, other than just mention them now. Uh, but the DNA is localized in a specific organelle. Now, what's an organelle? An organelle is a membrane surrounded sac. So while you have a cell here, like this, surrounded by a membrane, in a prokaryotic organism, you do not see any organelles within that cell. In a eukaryotic organism, there are sacs of varying size within the cell, each one having an individual identity, each one having an individual function. So the eukaryotic cell has internal organelles. The prokaryotic cell does not have any organelles. The major organelle one sees when one looks at a eukaryotic cell 
is the nucleus. And I know you have lab this week and you're looking at cells. You will be able to see um, this nucleus even in the light microscope. So the, this separation of cells based on the DNA and the structure of the cell is very commonly used in biology. You'll, you'll see re reference to eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells all the time. There's another way people characterize cells, and that's based more on their metabolism. And uh, it, it's, it's worthwhile putting this up because it, they're, they're terms that are, are used commonly. So we have one, we have cells which are known as autotrophic cells. This means self eaters. Okay, these cells, cell feeders, cell feeders, they can synthesize all the organic material they need from carbon dioxide and other simple organic compounds. So they use CO2. And there are really two types. There are photoautotrophs, and you can see from the name, these are, uh, they use light, sunlight. So these are photosynthetic organisms. And photosynthetic organisms use sunlight, and in the light, they convert carbon dioxide to sugar. That's the classic autotrophic kind of cell. But there are also chemoautotrophs, which are little unusual uh, keto, chemoautotrophs, I guess I should say. Autotrophs, which um, use simple organic compounds. Or, and inorganic compounds, actually. And CO2 to synthesize their uh, materials they need. We're talking about synthesizing proteins and nucleic acids. Then there's a second class of organisms, which are known as heterotrophic cells. Oh. And these are what are called other feeders. We're autotrophs. I'm sorry. We're, we're heterotrophs. We eat the products that are produced by other organisms, OK? So um, th th this is a terminology that's fairly common. And that's why I think I, I would mention it th at this point, because it, it is a characterization of cells. And it's not at all based on the basic structure of the cell. It's more based on the metabolic processes that are occurring in cells. And I will refer to you know photoautotrophs or heterotrophs, and you should know what that means. Uh, how do we study cells? Well, there are, I think there are two major ways we study cells. And I think one is sort of the classic way um, that biologists studied cell, have studied cells for 300 years. And that's, we look at them. And that's what you're doing in lab this week, microscopy. So basically, we. You know, Van Leeuwenhoek in the 1600s or something discovered or, or discovered, no, invented, that's the term I wanted, the microscope. And um, actually, when you walk through LSB, there's a display of very, very interesting old microscope. It's on this side of the building, <laughs> away from the library. Okay, the opposite side, and, and take a look at them someday. They're really beautiful instruments. There's a collection that's give, been given to the university by uh, a, a very elderly gentleman, and some of his microscopes are being shown in this collection. Okay, what you're going to be doing is obviously light microscopy, which has a, a limited sort of resolution, but it's possible to use other kinds of light sources and get higher resolution. And one can go as far as using doing electron microscopy, 
and, and increasing the resolution uh, enormously. Uh, in conjunction with microscopy, one people have developed specific what I call stains or reagents for specific components of the cell. And you'll be, you'll be doing some of this when, you, uh, uh, when you're, you're doing your mitosis experiment where you stain the cells with a compound that reacts with nucleic acid, the DNA of the cell, and then you follow the DNA during cell division, the chromosome. So there are specific stains that have been developed or there are natural compounds that one can use if you look at a if you look at a photoautotrophic cell, okay, in this case a plant cell, that would be a plant. If you look at a plant cell, everybody knows that chlorophyll is green, and you can identify where the chlorophyll is in a plant cell by looking for the green pigments. And they're all in the chloroplast. So they, if you see green localized in a region, you're looking at a chloroplast. That's kind of a trivial thing, but it's it is, um, it's, it's using a specific dye or compound to identify components in the cell. Um, it's also possible to make reagents that react with specific com components that are, that are labeled in some way with an antibody or with gold beads. There's a million different things that one can do. But it is possible to specifically try to label a specific a, a one component within a cell with a compound and then identify it by microscopy. Um, after 300 years or so, people started to develop new techniques for studying cells. And what I call this is not simply looking at them, but doing biochemistry. What does that mean? Biochemists. I'm a biochemist. Did I tell you that? The first thing biochemist, a biochemist does is he takes a material and he busts it up. You break it up. Somehow, you smash it with a hammer or you, know, you put it in a wearing blender. That's fairly common. And what one tends to want to do is to separate the cell into the internal components, the cellular components that exist within that cell. So if you look at figure 38, this shows exactly what is going to be done in the lab when you do the photosynthesis experiment. You take leaves, spinach leaves, and you put them in a wearing blender, just the kind of wearing blender you have at home. It's not any more sophisticated than that. And you blend the leaves up, and you disrupt the entire structure of the leaf, and you have a mess, a green mess. Okay, And then, by a procedure called differential centrifugation, where you put this glob, this mixture of components in a centrifuge, you spin it, it spins, the heavy things go down, the medium things stay in the middle, and the light things go to the top. It's just that simple. It turns out that you can isolate chloroplasts from plant, intact plant material, such as leaves, in literally five minutes. And when I say intact, these chloroplasts have all of the membranes around them, and they do what they are supposed to do inside the leaf. So it's a very, very straightforward, a very, very simple technique. You can then take the chloroplast apart. You can start to fractionate the chloroplast into its different components. For example, there's a membrane fraction, there's a soluble fraction, and you can continue this. And eventually what you're trying to do is you're trying to isolate and separate components out from other components. It's very difficult in, a, in an intact cell to uh, say this does this when there's so many other things around. But if you basically have, let's say, the membrane component of the chloroplast, you can very easily show, and this is what you do, that the light reactions of photosynthesis occur in that fraction of the cell. So cellular fractionation is, is a very, very powerful technique. Uh, it also is a technique fraught with danger because there are, uh, of course, artifacts that can pre be produced when you remove components from a cell and you have to be aware of these artifacts and make sure that you don't have artifacts. Um, figures 36 and 37 are sort of this grand summary. 30, 37 are pictures of cells. I urge you to look at the pictures of the cells in Campbell. 
They have very, very nice pictures in that chapter of cells and the structure of units within the cell. Much better than I have here, but for sake of completeness, I put these in. Figure table 36 is a very um, useful table that summarizes the difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. Uh, I haven't talked about all of these things, but I, I have indicated, for example, membrane-bound nucleus, no and yes. Uh, turns out that you'll see this in lab. Prokaryotes are very small cells. Eukaryotes are much larger cells. And then there's a bunch of other, um, a, a bunch of other properties that distinguish the prokaryotes from the eukaryotes. When you look at a bacterial cell, such as figure 37, I used to say it's just a bag of proteins. And that's, somebody chastised me for doing that. Um, there, there's no obvious organization. If you compare the bacterial cell with the animal cell or the plant cell, I hope you can see the complexity of the eukaryotic cell. The complexity of the eukaryotic cell arises because of the many organelles that are present in that cell. There is no such organization in a prokaryote. Anyway, please look, look at the figures in the book. Um, when you look at a eukaryotic cell, there are immediately different regions within the cell. So here's a, this is a eukaryotic cell. It has a nucleus. There's uh, a region around the nucleus, everything but the nucleus. That region is known as the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, there are two different things. There are organelles, other organelles, which I can indicate with circles and squares. And then there's a medium, the liquid medium which is known as the cytosol. So the cytoplasm contains the cytosol plus the various organelles that are in the cell. And the cytosol contains the, is the soluble component, the soluble matrix, I guess I would say, which surrounds all of the organelles within the cell. Much of the basic metabolism of a cell occurs in the cytosol. Lots of the things we are going to talk about subsequently to this series of lectures, are metabolic processes that occur in the cytosol. So don't think that the cytosol is not an important component within the cell. Why, what is the advantage of having this type of organization? Organelles, particularly. Well, it turns out that you can compartmentalize function. For example, um, you can have one organelle here, which is involved in energy production, which is a complicated series of reactions. And these are known in, as mitochondria. And you'll see, we'll talk about them in some detail. All of the energy production, not all, most of the energy production in the eukaryotic cell occurs in the mitochondrion, which is the thing you know. So a special function in a special organelle. You have organelles such as lysosomes, which are involved in um, the degradation of biological molecules, of polymers. Some of the polymers we talked about, polysaccharides and proteins, are broken down in lysosomes. And I'll give you more detail as to why this uh, special environment of the lysosome is so important in the cell. So compartmentalization is important in the eukaryotic cell because you can separate out in separate environments which are enclosed by, an or by, a, by a lipid, phospholipid bilayer membrane special functions. And um, that's an important point. The eukaryotic cell is a very complicated cell. I'm not sure I believe this, but I, this is a number I saw and I read in actually a Nobel Prize winner's lecture, that a mammalian cell contains 1 billion protein molecules, 10 to the 10th. This cell contains 10 to the 10th proteins. Let's assume this is a liver cell, okay? which is 
the general mammalian type eukaryotic cell. Um, now, we know uh, that there are approximately, the number keeps changing, um, 30,000 genes. Genes are the things that are making proteins for proteins. So you can see that to go from 30,000 to 1 billion, you have to make a lot of different proteins, a lot of proteins, many of them many, 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 many times. So a cell doesn't have 30,000 proteins, it has a, a billion proteins. The billion protein number I is important because a major problem that exists in a eukaryotic cell is to put the right protein in the right place. And I'm going to talk a lot about this, I don't have time today, on Friday. This is a problem of protein targeting. That is, if many of the proteins in a eukaryotic cell are made in the cytosol, which is true, they have to go into either the nucleus, into the mitochondrion, into the lysosome, etc. So there's a real serious problem, mechanistic problem, of how do you put the right protein in the right place. I think you can see that uh, if I have a protein that's absolutely required for mitochondrial function and I put it in the nucleus, I have a dead mitochondria. Okay? The mitochondria will not function, we will not survive that kind of mistake. So this has to be a, a system that basically is foolproof, no mistakes, because we cannot have proteins put in the wrong place, all right? And we're going to talk a lot about that because it is one of the major um, areas of modern cell biology, trying to understand how proteins are targeted to their right and final position within this eukaryotic cell. Okay, I, I don't want to start anything else at this point, so I'll leave you a few minutes early. And on Friday, we're going to talk about the organelles within the eukaryotic cell and how they get their proteins in there.